so let me introduce Mike, Mike Vigo. Mike is, uh, you're now the past president of the uh, Diablo Beekeepers, correct? Correct. Lucky me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, also uh, runs a business that is, that manages bees throughout the Bay Area. And um, you've been a big keeper for a long time and um, I'll let you hear, I believe you're gonna discuss um, basic beekeeping techniques and that type of thing. Great. All right, and so here's Mike. Uh, I just wanna say thank you very much for allowing me to speak, I think. We'll soon find out about that. Um, but I titled this a discussion of spring management. Jerry asked me to do a talk on spring management, and I said I would. And as I started to delve into it, I realized it's pretty, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I kind of figured it's pretty simple block and tackle kind of stuff. So I am going to ask some of the beekeepers on, that are uh, present tonight, um, maybe for some of their input after I give some of my input. And I would say that because I'm into the, Al uh, the uh, Halfheimer stage of my life. If you have a question, ask it. Don't wait till the end. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, so we'll see how we go. Um, let's see here. Now, there we go. So just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Figo. I started uh, the Bee Ranchers in 2011. Um, four or five years before that, we as a family, my three daughters at the time, um, joined 4-H, got introduced to the beekeeping project. They came home and said, hey, dad, we joined the beekeeping project. We're going to have bees at our house. And I said, no, we're not. And um, at the time, the only male in the family, I, use, I usually lose every argument. So I lost that argument. And I'm thankful that I did because I've been completely addicted ever since. Um, so I started the Bee Ranchers in 2011. Um, we manage beehives for families and businesses throughout the Bay Area. Um, so kind of before... My, I'm in the way, but um, my springtime before beekeeping, uh, to me, springtime meant the crack of the bat, master's golf tournament, longer days. Now it's buzzing bees, and I have no time for baseball or golf. Um, so uh, just kind of delve into it. Springtime, um, so I manage, like I said, a number of hives throughout the Bay Area. I see a lot of hives on a day-in and day-out basis. And, and when I think of springtime and beekeeping, it starts about August. And I say that because we're really beginning to prepare our hives for the wintertime. And we want our hives to be as strong as we can going into winter. So it gives them the best chance to come out of winter and head into the springtime, uh, AKA now, uh, as strong as possible. So I'm in that process, August, September, and into October, I'm taking off um, honey supers. As the colonies are shrinking uh, naturally, uh, we're beginning to, I'm beginning to reduce the spaces um, that they have as, uh, as they need it. Uh, I'm assessing mite loads over and over again, but especially that time of the year, because we want, um, you know, very strong colonies, again, going into that winter time. Um, I'm looking at colonies that um, could possibly be requeened. Maybe the requeen's a couple years old. Um, she's not laying nearly as much as she was, you know, a year or two ago. Um, I'm, I'm trying to identify some of the weaker colonies that I have, um, combining them with others to give them the best chances of survival. And then I begin planning um, my winter time uh, to repair and replace old, old and broken equipment. Um, here's just an example, you know, Beekeepers I've found are pretty frugal in a good way. And uh, instead of throwing frames out, um, what I'll do is I'll pop old foundation out. I'll buy a new foundation, clean up all the frames. The frames that are broken or just not worth salvaging, they make great uh, kindling. So I use those in my fire pit and then pop in new foundation for the following winter. And then double bag the uh, foundation that I'm not using uh, double bag that and trash bags and throw it in the dump. So we're, we've, we're lucky enough, hopefully, to have um, to make it into kind of the February March time frame is when I kind of say we're beginnings of, of the springtime. There's usually that one really nice week in February where everything just pops 
bees are going crazy. We're in short sleeves. Um, yellow jackets start, the queens start coming out, trying to, to, to grab those with uh, putting out traps and that kind of stuff. So for me, the springtime, I think, is the easiest time of the year, except for the swarm sensation, which I can't stand, but we'll get into that um, a little bit later. But the days are getting longer. Colonies, if they've made it through this, uh, if they've made it through February into March, um, they're, they're definitely growing, or they should be growing. And you're now back into that mode of, instead of taking boxes off, I'm beginning to add brood boxes. Um, and if you have colonies that get down into, I, I strictly use deeps, uh, two deeps and then mediums on top of that as my honey supers. So if I've got colonies that go into a single deep over the winter time, um, usually those colonies have 10 drawn out frames on 10 frame colonies. Um, once we get to uh, six or seven frames of bees, I'll add a second box uh, to give that queen more room. Mike be good. Oh. And um, I will also, if, if we have a new box, you know, this is kind of jumping forward here, but if you're, if you're starting afresh this spring, you're starting with either, I hate to say it in this, with this setting in this group, but a pack, uh, package bees or you've caught a swarm and you're gonna put them into a brand new colony. Um, I won't add a second box until they've grown, uh, drawn out at least eight frames of comb in those new uh, in those new frames, then I'll add that second box. Once you once I add the second box, um, and they again we have either eight frames of bees, or they've drawn out or six or seven frames of bees. Excuse me. So we're going to have a total of fifteen frames of bees and twenty frames of drawn out comb. Then I'll add a honey super on top of that. I use queen excluders, but if it's a brand new uh, box with new frames in it, I'll wait again. Wait till that's drawn out at least eight frames of comb. Um, and then usually what I'll do at this time of the year is um, instead of adding honey supers, a lot of times bees like to move up, queens like to move up. So they're, they're laying up in the upper parts of the uh, brood chamber. Um, and the bottom, the bottom brood box is typically going to be a little bit lighter. So I'll flip flop the brood boxes. And it kind of artificially gives me a little more time as the queen moves up into there. Um, she's got more room to lay in that regard. Um, as far as, um, uh, what was I gonna say? As far as how I manipulate frames and what I'm looking for as I inspect hives, generally speaking, my rule of thumb is, I don't think we need in this day in, uh, in our area, the Bay Area in total, um, obviously we have microclimates, so every, every area is a little bit different, but generally speaking, I like to have uh, two frames of, uh, four frames of honey in each box. So in the one and two position and the nine and 10 position in the upper and the lower, and that will leave 12 frames for the uh, queen to be laying in, in theory. Now, obviously there's going to be pollen stores, a band of pollen stores and honey stores on those brood, brood frames for the nurse bees to, uh, to grab some food and feed the young. Um, but that's generally speaking how I do it. Um, if, you're call if colonies start storing more and more food, um, I'll swap in empty frames, whether that's drawn or new foundation. And, and I check the board and what I call intelligently. So, and I don't, I should have kind of drawn, put some kind of a drawing in there. But if we, um, if you have 10 frames and you've got six frames of jam packed um, uh, drawn or uh, brood, and this picture here, I tried to blow it up and I couldn't get it blown up to, um, for you guys to see it more, but I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this frame that I'm holding and looking at is pretty much floor to ceiling, wall to wall, uh, cat brood. So very nice laying queen, um, a brood or a nine and one eighth uh, frame, which this is, holds about roughly 3,500 cells. And so she's not laid 3,500 cells there, but she's probably got 3,000. So you can see how quickly a colony can ramp up in terms of uh, the population. And if, if um, 10,000 bees covers roughly 5,000 deep frames, then, and you, and you walk into a colony this time of the year and you're seeing um, a frame that looks like this or multiple frames like look, look, looking like that, you better be prepared um, 
to either add frames or when you're coming back to inspect and I inspect all my hives every 10 to 14 days, uh, add more space because they're going to run out super quickly. Um, let's see here. I think that's all I had to say on that. Yeah, any questions so far? And um, I would also offer, I would also suggest that I'm going to put a couple of people on hold. These, just because this is the way I do it doesn't mean it's the only way. There's a million different ways to skin this cat. And we've got some wonderful beekeepers in this club and there's a number of them um, in this meeting right now. So I'm just gonna ask a couple people if they do anything different, um, cause I like to learn. Um, I think it's best to uh, get your pin, get opinions from uh, different people. So we'll start at the top. Mr. Garcia, you run a number of hives. Do you do anything differently? Is there another tip that you can give give us all that uh, will help in? Um... No, no, I, I think that was, I mean, you, you laid it out really clear. I, I, you know, I've done in the past, I've done single brood chambers. Um, it's, it's a lot more hassle because uh, you have to manage more because you, you've got to make sure the honey stays out of it because they need that room. But uh, the doubles, I'm doing a lot more double brood chambers now than, than I ever did before. And I'm, I'm, I am liking it. And uh, just to, just on a note, you know, kind of the rule of thumb I use is if I have a frame of brood, like you're looking at there, you know, given attrition and, and the, the brood's going to hatch, you know, that, that cap brood is going to hatch in 10 days. So you're going to, you're going to have roughly one frame gives you two more frames. Uh, so that's kind of the B map I, I use. So if I have seven frames of brood, that's going to, that, that's, you know, in this time of year, there's a good chance I'm going to have 10 to 14 frames of bees at some point in the very near future. Yep. It's all about that, more or less, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. Rob, Robert McKimmy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Do you can have you hear me? Uh, Yes, we can. So, okay, great. I think, I think we all know Robert, but uh, predominantly, Robert, you're in the city and maybe uh, Marin County. Are you noticing anything? Do you do anything different? You've been doing this a long time. Uh, no, it's, it's so far, it's been a little bit cold in most of my locations. So the buildup's not quite as fast. And eucalyptus really didn't bloom over here very much. So that's really slowed things down. But the big boomer hives are, are doing extremely well. And no, I think everything's fine. So it's just a matter of, for me, it's just if, if people already have bees going, just making sure you throw a box. And I always lift up my honey box and throw the empty drawn comb, you know, just above the brood box so the queen's got plenty of space to lay. So, right. so I that's think the only how I avoid that. That's the key. Just yeah. make sure that queen has um, plenty of space to, to lay. Yep. Uh, to kind of. But I, I, but I really love the fact that you're, you're doing more nutrition and things like that. And again, sure bees, I, I really like that you're making bees strong through the winter. Well, that's what we, I think we all hope to do. I can't say that I'm doing right. it hundred percent successfully, <laughs> but uh, that's definitely the goal. Um, Jerry, how about you? Sir, uh, well, a, a number to remember is that uh, queens can lay from 2,000 to 3,000 3, eggs in a day, according to uh, our knowledge base, the internet. Uh, so uh, they can build up to populations of 40,000 in the time that it takes uh, for uh, the queen to wrap around, uh, you know, laying in two boxes as you uh, outlined. Um, I think the challenge in spring is uh, manipulating the space, especially if you want the colony not to swarm. Uh, you have to give them enough, uh, the queen enough room to lay eggs and uh, give the bees enough of a signal that there's work still to be done uh, if you wanna suppress their tendency to swarm. That's my two cents. Yep, no, I used that. to have worked in, my, in our yard. Uh, when I keep after that, uh, we can often keep a colony from uh, generating a swarm. Very, very valid points. Norm Watt. Any words of wisdom from Norm? Are you there, Norm? You're on mute. There you go. You're off mute. Okay, 
we'll, we'll come back to Norm. Norm, if you can holler at me, holler at me. Um, okay, any other questions out there? I see, is, is there anything in the chat room? No, oh, not yet. Um, okay. Oh, the one other thing I would say about management is if you want to manage to uh, make a lot of splits, uh, now is the time to start implementing your plan. Yeah, I think we're going to get there here pretty quick. Um, all right, if I hit that, there we go. So here's just another picture, um, 10 frames, the colony. This is um, fairly new. I mean, this is an old picture, but fairly new in the season. You can see that bees are what I would count as, you know, eight and a half, maybe nine or eight and a half frames of bees in there. Um, so that's getting ready to add a second box to it. All right. Um, my biggest metric when I'm checking hives um, is how many frames of bees I have. And I write it down after I have a computer program that I input all my notes in. So because I have half timers, I have no idea what I did two weeks prior. So I can look at my notes before I go into the hive again. Um, so that is my number one metric. If I come to a hive and I see, and I had 10 frames of bees the last visit, and I now have 17 frames of bees, then generally speaking, um, I think we've got a really good healthy colony. If there's less than 10 frames of bees, or if other hives I've been checking are going from 10 to 15 to 17, or they're growing, um, nicely and I come back and I still only have 10 frames of bees or, or less, then I really have to dig in to see what's going on there. So that's when I really go into hives, make sure I've got a good laying queen, a really good brood pattern, not a spotty shotgun type of a pattern. Uh, you know, do they have enough food? Um, perhaps they're not, uh, you know, February and March can be really, really warm and then get really cold like it is in the last couple of days here and windy and rainy. And all of a sudden things get shut down and um, uh, the weather patterns can, can throw us into a little bit of a tizzy. So make sure you've got food, chances are you should, but if they're not growing, then that, that could be a problem. Um, the, other, the other problem that I have seen, not a lot, but I have seen at this time of the year um, in terms of disease is chalk root. And chalk root is usually coming out of the winter time um, where you have an apiary or a hive that's in a cooler area, maybe it's not ventilated that well, it's got a lot of moisture, and uh, chalk root can um, begin to uh, show uh, rear its ugly head. So chalk root, I've never lost a hive to chalk root, but when you see it, you want to make sure you get all of the, the uh, mummies out of the hive, they've got the uh, fung fungi in it. Um, I clean the bottom board out real good, um, clean out the uh, dump, the mummies, Make sure they have food. Um, you can give them a little bit of pollen patty to jumpstart them. And they usually as the days get warmer, the chalk root, the chalk root goes away, but it will, it will definitely slow things down. <coughs> the thing I do when I go into a hive, before I even go into a hive, as I'm approaching it, um, you can really smell the fresh drawn beeswax. I know we all have um, the nectar and the ripening honey. Um, if there's a lot of forging going on um, on a sunny day, if you have time, um, you don't have to go into the hives all the time, but you can just sit and observe from the outside um, a lot of things as clues to how well the hive is doing um, in any particular time. If you have the time, grab a beer or your favorite beverage, go up there and count how many bees are going in in a minute. Um, if you have more than 75 uh, on a sunny day and you got a lot of pollen going in, um, different colors of pollen, um, good diverse uh, food, then I think um, you're probably in really good shape. You can also kind of um, not tilt the hive, but just kind of move it around. If it's getting heavier, um, then you know they're bringing in uh, food sources and, and things are, are rolling along. Uh, when you're pulling the cover off uh, with your hive tool, whether it's a um, migratory top cover or an inner cover with a telescoping cover, which I think probably most of us have. Um, if I pull that off and I see bridge comb or um, usually full of honey um, coming out of the hole in the top of the inner cover, and it takes a lot to pull that inner cover off and you pull it off and there's nothing but honey in there, then you know you're going to be running out of room real quick if you haven't run out of room already. 
Um, the other thing I'm doing this time of the year now is what is the mite count? Um, I'm a big proponent of, of knowing what your mite loads are on a month in and out, month out basis. And uh, as the bees are growing here, so is the, uh, the uh, mite population. And um, that's very, very important to me. So a lot of the times I'm finding that I'm treating this time of the year, knocking down those mite loads, giving the bees a real good chance to uh, build up nicely going into the summertime. Um, I don't care what, how you treat, what your management plan is. All I care about is that you have a management plan. Um, I've said it before and people laugh at me, but if you think that sticking your thumb in a belly button in front of a hive for 10 minutes knocks down the mite loads, more power to you. Just have real good notes to be able to defend your methodology. Um, so as we're going into April, or excuse me, March, April, and then into May, it's more or less rinse and repeat from February, but now it's really um, where you got to watch that, that swarming sensation. Honeybees have been swarming for, you know, it's in their DNA. Uh, I don't think you can, in, you, you can't mitigate it completely, but you can do things to um, slow it down. And if you're really on top of it, um, catch the swarms that uh, ultimately happen if you miss them. But some of the things I do, in fact, this last weekend, I had a couple of strong hives in my bee yard. So I split them into uh, smaller hives. Um, every time I do an inspection uh, these few months, um, I always go down and uh, I play this game and I'm sure it's not full. I know it's not foolproof, but um, this picture, if you can see it, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these are a bunch of different swarm cups. They're not queen cells yet, but they're swarm cups. But if I were to let those go, they will be queen cells um, in another week or so. And so I cut them out. And the different, uh, it's been said before, Jerry's done a really good job in the last couple months, um, year in and year out. Um, and um, I forget who's, who's the big proponent on split, who just did the splitting hives on the LBI meeting the other night. Oh, that was uh, Phil. Phil, um, he does a great job of explaining how to do it. And it's a great discussion, but um, yeah, I cut those swarm cups out. Um, I'll split colonies um, into smaller colonies. Um, but when you see swarm cups like that, you know that the colony is beginning to get crowded. So it goes back to manipulating frames, making sure queens have um, room to, room to uh, lay. When I checkerboard, you have to be a little bit careful, especially this time of the year, because if the queen's got, let's just say in my perfect example, in a perfect world, those six middle frames. So frame number three through seven is all full of um, um, larva and brood. You don't want to split that brood nest. Um, you don't want to split it up by putting a, an empty frame in the middle of it because um, it makes it hard for the bees to kind of keep everything warm and, um, and uh, healthy. So what I'll do is I'll take uh, either frame number two or frame number three out one of those two is going to be full of honey and food stores and pop a new one in or frame number seven or eight or eight or nine. Um, you just don't, I don't like to put empty frames into the middle of a brood nest is, is my point there. Um, the other thing we can do um, is put bait hides out. I know Jerry drills this in both clubs that I've been in with him year in and year out and he's absolutely correct. Put bait hides out in your apiary. Um, there's, um, you can have little nooks <clears throat> out there with some um, old drawn comb in them. You can put uh, bait hives up in trees. Um, somebody was talking about uh, in the last month or so, taking all the slum gum and putting that into a bait hive. I've seen people where they've taken that slum gum. I haven't tried it yet and I keep saying I'm going to, um, so maybe I'll do it this year, but take that slum gum and at the bottom of your, uh, I use a wax melter when I'm cleaning my wax. So you can put a rope or um, a metal rod in the middle of that slum gum. And when it hardens, you can pull the, the rod out or the, or the rope out. And then you have a disc on that rope, uh, tie a loop on the end of that rope, you know, it has to be a couple feet and then tie that to a tree. And if you're really smart, you'll put it on a pulley about 15, 20 feet up. So if you do get a swarm, and they're attracted to that slum gum and they're clustered there, 
all you have to do is lower the uh, lower the rope on the pulley down into either a hive or a, a bucket or a box or whatever and transport that and transfer it into um, some empty equipment that you have. Um, it goes without saying year round, of course, but make sure your bees have a good water source. Um, the other thing about swarming, and I keep going back and forth with this, and the right answer is we have to be responsible beekeepers. Most of us are in neighborhoods, so we want to prevent them from swarming as much as possible. But a lot of times with this Varroa that's got me wrapped around the axle, um, when hives do swarm, it's a brood break. And I think we're seeing more and more of it because it's a mechanism that the bees are trying to use to um, manage their, it's their way of managing Varroa. And we don't want swarms going through neighborhoods, obviously, but if you have a big enough property, you know, maybe uh, you know, somebody like Jim can get away with it. Um, you let them swarm, but if you let them swarm, make sure you've got those bait traps out there um, so you can catch them. It's probably not the best thing to say, but um, I keep going back and forth with my in my mind about uh, just let them swarm. Um, the, obviously, the downside is if you're into honey production, you're going to lose you're going to lose some honey production that way because it kicks your uh, sets your hive back about 35 days or so. But um, it's better to try to prevent the swarming, try to capture the swarms, have those bait hives. Um, as the hives get, they build up. So in my last, in my example, I said a couple of minutes ago, five frames of bees is roughly 10,000 bees. So one brood box is 20,000 bees, two brood boxes, the way I use it, it would be 40,000 bees. And then you start putting honey supers up. Pretty soon you're going to have 50, 60,000 bees in there and it can get um, a little bit unwieldy, um, especially if you're new to this, uh, this hobby. So one of the easiest things to do is to just get a piece of cardboard or a piece of plywood um, as a ramp and put it on your front entrance. And as you're pulling out um, frame number one, shake those bees onto that ramp and they'll crawl right up back into the hive um, and they're kind of out of your way. So you're not shaking or sweeping on or uh, sweeping off the same bees all the time. That's how they get, if they get rolled or whatever, they can get um, angry pretty quickly. Um, I mentioned it, but I, spec, I inspect every hive 10 to 14 days. Um, any more than that, I feel that I'm getting in the way. Honeybees have been, be, have been honeybees much longer than we've been managing honeybees. And the less invasive we are, I think the better off they are. Um, we're just there to make them as efficient as possible. Um, and they're already probably, as far as I'm concerned, the most efficient machine in the natural world. Um, again, rearrange frames in your brood nest. Um, we're doing that, you know, pretty much through May. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you can add your honey supers. Again, I use queen excluders. Um, and then I add my honey supers. Someone was mentioning in the, um, the bee chat or the kind of the social part before that, they wanted to have some cut comb and uh, the bees decided to use the cut comb frames that she wanted to have cut comb at as, as uh, drone comb. So queen excluder would, uh, would eliminate that problem. Um, and then as your honey supers are getting full, time to harvest. And it's, I have a hive, strongest hive I've ever, ever had, it happens to be at my brother's house in Lafayette. I put the first super on in January came back in February, that super was full and capped, added the second super, and I won't be surprised if I can harvest that one here in the next three or four weeks, which I really don't want to do. Mike? So I'll have to. Yes. Uh, when you're adding a super, um, suppose the bees don't really want to move up into it. How do you move them up into it? Uh, great question. So the easiest answer is um, you can take so one of the, mis I'm gonna answer it this way. Uh, the easiest answer is to take some, um, dr uh, you know, a drawn um, uh, comb that you already have and put it up there. Um, it's a little bit harder the way I've set my uh, hives up in the very beginning. Had I done, had I um, known then what I know now, I would have been, I would, all my equipment would have been mediums. My back is killing me. Um, and more importantly, you've got the same size frames all the way through. So then you can take, it makes it easier because if you have, you know, medium boxes in your brood chamber, you can take those medium frames of honey and put them up into your honey super and put the empty frames down into your 
uh, brood nest and it works out really, really well. So for those, for those beekeepers that are uh, just about to start out and you haven't bought your equipment yet, which I'm sure probably none of us are in that position right now, but uh, seriously think about um, mediums and, you know, even, I would even go to maybe eight frame mediums. That's how much my back hurts. Um, so any, so here we are, I'm going to ask again, the same people, Norm, I'll start with Norm. Norm, can you hear me? Can you take yourself off new, uh, mute and add any um, words of wisdom? All right, Robert, you got any words of wisdom? What are you seeing in San, what do you do in San Francisco when it's, I was thinking about you today, you know, the old saying from Mark Twain, the coldest winter I ever spent was the summer in San Francisco. Um, do you have hides out in the avenues? Uh, Golden I've Gate got, Park, I'm sure you do. Yeah, I've got hives pretty much in every area. It just depends on when it's when it's a nice sunny day, they it, they get out and fly, and otherwise they stay in. So right. I just get less honey than all the rest of you. But Pardon everything me? else is, I get less honey than the rest of you. Got it, got it. Uh, uh, yeah, but aside from that, you, everything you said is correct. Uh, Jerry, what do you, what what is what do you do? Um, anything different? Well, um, one thing that we do in our yard is um, almost all of our frames are foundationless, and uh, it seems to me that uh, when the bees draw out a brood frame uh, in a foundationless frame. They generally put the uh, brood in, uh, worker brood in the middle and they'll draw larger cells on the outside, which they will use for drone or they'll use for honey later. Um, what I do not notice as much uh, work at is uh, uh, scraping comb off of the top bars and the bottom bars of the frames because they're, uh, they don't need to draw big cells there for drone because they've got them right there in the frame. Uh, so you get trade-offs, you know, you, you have uh, the mixture of cell sizes in the brood combs, uh, but no, uh, but less work to do grooming the outside of frames, uh, but then you have the inconvenience of that mixture of cell sizes. If you use all foundation, then the bees have to draw the big cells somewhere, and they'll either uh, misdraw the uh, comb on the, on the foundation or they'll, they'll fill up all of the spaces between the frames that they can. Got it. How about uh, Jim? Yeah, the only thing I was gonna add is that um, you count bees. I, I also count bees as, as a very important matrix. To me, the number of bees in the, in the hive at that time is the strength of that hive. It's how much honey they're gonna be bringing in. Larger hives bringing more honey. The other thing I also count though is uh, brood frames. To me, brood brood is the future. So if I you know, so I do a, just a quick as I'm going through the hive, just a slide look down. Is there brood? You know, it's not scientific. But is there brood? No brood. Count the number of frames. If I have, uh, you know, do my my quick bee math, and that gives you kind of where your hive is going to be in the in the future. So brood to me is also a very important uh, metric to to count. Okay, good. Um, so I'm just looking through the chat. Uh, okay, so one question Wolfgang has, why do you reduce the hive to just one box over winter? Why don't you leave it at two? That, that's um, probably to me. It's to everyone it says, but um, anyway, Wolfgang, the reason I do, I only do it if it, it's, it, the, the bees dictate it. If I've got eight or 10 frames of bees in there, I'll leave it at, at uh, you know, or more, I'll leave it at, at two boxes. But if I'm, if I'm getting down to four or five frames of bees, I don't want to have to have the bees try to heat up and keep warm all that dead space. Um, it also is a place for, especially in the winter time, um, for wax moth uh, to get into. Um, they can't defend it as well. And it's just, it makes the bees less efficient because they, they're trying to heat up everything and they're not, they don't need all that space. So that's the real reason I do it. Um, and if the humidity is high, uh, it can get a little bit moldy inside. Correct. Absolutely. And the bees aren't cleaning it up if there aren't enough bees. Um, Ellen asks, uh, can you tell the number of frames of bees just by looking down and seeing how many of the tops of the frames have been on, have bees on them, as in the photo shown? Uh, you can. You can, you know, a lot of times a, a frame of bees to me is when 
you know, 50, 60, 70% of that frame is covered. Um, a lot of times I can look down on the top of a frame and if I see a uh, cap and brood all the way up the top in a number of the middle frames, then I know I've got a strong hive as well. Um, so you don't always have to go deep, deep into the hive. In fact, um, I'll say it, if I haven't said it early, I'll say it um, later, but um, again, when you go into a hive, when you're doing your inspection, you really should only be doing it with a couple, of, you know, if you have a couple of questions you need answered. And as soon as those questions are answered, whether it's the first five seconds or it takes you 10 or 15 minutes, close everything up and you're done. Again, the less invasive um, you are in the hive, I believe anyway, um, the better off the bees are. Um, so if I want to make sure I've got a nice laying queen, if I go take the first frame out, it's going to usually be the first couple frames are usually going to be food stores. If I get into that third frame and I see lots and lots of larva, I don't even bother looking for eggs. If I see a little bit of larva, I'll look for eggs. If I see eggs on that frame, then I'm done. I don't have to find the queen. Um, a lot of times it's fun to find the queen. We were talking about that earlier. Another neat trick, and again, it's not something I invented, but I think I um, saw it from um, uh, Randy Oliver, is when you're, look, when you're pulling a frame out, um, look at that next frame. And queens are usually a little bit taller and she'll stand out. Um, and Jerry mentioned it earlier, and that's my, one of my me biggest mentors. It was one of Jer uh, Jim's biggest mentors. He always stressed to me, look for what's not, look for what's different. So the queen is different. Usually she's not gonna be completely engulfed in, be in bees. They give her her space as she's traveling around. Um, obviously if she's marked, um, and I don't, I. I don't always mark my queens, but if she's marked, um, it makes it a little bit easier to find her. Um, but you want to look for what's different. Um, a little bit like Boris Waldo, but um, if you think of it with that mindset, mindset, you'll get better and better and better at, at finding that queen. But again, you don't necessarily have to find her. It's nice to know where she is. So when you're putting frames back, you're very cognizant so you don't squish her or, or damage her in any way. Um, but it's, it's not uh, my goal every time I go into a hive to, to actually find that queen. Um, if there's any more questions here. What do you use attracting your water sources and what's the ratios? Uh, Jesse asked, what do you use as an attractant in your water sources and what's the ratios? Um, I like dirty water. So I don't know what the ratio is, but when I have I tell my clients um, or in my own yard, um, I'll have my water source out there and I'm putting in leaves and twigs and a little bit of mud. Um, I found that um, peat moss, go to just a local nursery and get, grab some peat moss, throw that in there. It helps with the water not evaporating as quickly and it gets dirty and the bees can land on it, they won't drown. Another thing, make sure you've got rocks or something in there for the bees to land on so they don't drown and they can get out. Um, but that's After the wine corks. You can use wine corks. You can use tennis balls. If you put wine corks, um, maybe throw some toothpicks or something in there because it's like rolling logs. Um, you really got a um, is that a Cal Poly hat? Yes, it's a Cal Poly hat. Um, is anyone using one deep and one medium for the brew chambers? That's a California um, brew chamber. I think there, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there using them. Um, you just, you have a little bit less space for the queen. So you really gotta be on top of it. But um, as your supers get, as you super up, you can use those medium frames in that brood chamber and use those to go back and forth um, by in expanding that, that brood nest. Um, do I count cat brood or all brood? I count the frames of bees. So whether it's um, brood or otherwise. Um, it's nice to know how much cat brood you, you're, you have, but generally speaking, you're gonna have four to six frames in there, sometimes more. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. All right, I think that's enough for now. So I'm gonna move on. Um, I noticed how you just joined or joined re here recently. Do you have any words of wisdom to add? You've been at this a while. Um, no, just listening to the stories and um, 
always picking up tips. Um, it's it's a lot of basic blocking and tackling, and I wish I had a, a, a nice, uh, you know, innovative. Here's the one thing to do, but um, these are they kind of tell us what to do. Um, all right, so moving on, I think I have a bunch of pictures. So if I hit that, oh, go back. So this is supposed to be a video, but anyway, so this is just a this is just a big cookie sheet um, that I have on on one rooftop. And when I when the bees get super crowded, I'll just shake the bees on this uh, ramp. A lot of times when I'm harvesting honey um, is when I do it a lot. Um, shake the bees on the ramp, and then I can sweep the few bees remaining and put them in a separate box to take them off the roof. But they just march right in, and if I could figure out how to hit play, maybe um, no, it's not working. Um, but they're marching right in. Uh, so I think this next picture is just the water source. Um, I thought it was a cool picture. This is just a regular bird bath with a bunch of rocks in it. The water's kind of dirty, and they love it. Uh, I have another client who's got um, a fountain with rocks all around the bottom and the fountain comes up. It's got a spout and it's splashing water everywhere. And um, on hot summer days, um, springtime days, they're all on the edges, just uh, picking up droplets of water. So here's a, what I would obviously count as 10 frames full of bees. It's a very, very healthy colony. Um, and this is a perfect example when you come across a colony like this and you've got a lot of bees, you take that first frame out, shake the bees onto that ramp. And uh, I use frame holder, so I'll put the frame in the holder and then go to the next one. Or if all the bees are off it, you can um, lay it on the ground or uh, lean it up against the hive um, on, on its end. If you put it on its bot on the bottom rail, a lot of times you're gonna have honey or bridge comb and that'll pick up sticks and rocks and whatnot when you put it back in there. It just gets the hive dirtier. Um, mite testing. There were, we were talking about this earlier. Um, again, I'll harp on it. There's um, Randy, if you haven't heard of Randy Oliver, which I think you probably all have, scientific beekeeping, it's probably the number one source to go to as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's plenty of sources out there, but his is real good. Um, in terms of, I use sugar rolls when, I, um, when I'm checking for mites. Um, if you search YouTube, just sugar roll, honeybee sugar roll for Varroa, and you'll come up with a bunch of different videos. Some are real good, some are not so good, but I think you can quickly figure out and, and um, um, figure out which ones are the better ones and which ones aren't. Obviously, if you're doing uh, either sugar roll or alcohol wash, you've got to know where your queen is. So before I... Um, and, and the frames that I use uh, to determine my mic my count are going to be in, I want a frame of open larva, lots of it. Um, it's usually going to be in the center, you know, four, five, or six, um, in terms of frame four, five, or six. And that's the um, frame I thoroughly, thoroughly look for a queen, make sure she's not on that frame. Sometimes I'll go through those middle frames, all of them, to find the queen, so I know I'm not taking her and um, knocking her around or God forbid, get her into an alcohol wash and kill her. Um, again, once you know what your mite loads are, um, implement your, um, you can implement your plan according to your management plan and have it, have a plan to deal with Varroa. It's the number one, it's probably 80% of the honeybees demise right now. And if we could eliminate that, our lives would be a lot easier. And I think I've got some pictures so I take that frame of open larva. I've got a little white bucket. I um, tap that um, a little more than gentle, but knock all the bees into that bucket. And you see them all there. Take my half of my uh, uh, cup of bees, put them in my uh, mason jar. It's got a screen lid on it. You can't see it. Shake that up for a couple of minutes. Uh, the bees are fanning in there. They're, um, they're getting really warm. The powdered sugar is and the heat are dislodging the mites. And then I shake that onto um, a white paper plate. I use a white lid from the bucket that I use and sprinkle it with, mist it with water and to dissolve the powdered sugar and then you can count the mites. My eyes aren't that good, but I think 
Can you see my cursor moving around? No. No? Okay, well, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, I think six frame or six mites, I think I see here. Um, the general rule of thumb is 3% threshold. So a cup of bees is 300 bees, or is it half a cup of bees? I think it's a cup of bees. It's 300 bees, 3% of that's nine. The powdered sugar um, assessment is not that accurate. It's, I've heard anywhere from 70, 80% accurate. So if I have six or seven mites, it's, it's time for me to uh, implement my uh, management plan for Varroa. Alcohol wash is much more accurate. And again, I'm, I'm doing this in every apiary that I have um, once a month. Mike? Um, yes. Randy's um, talking about using Dove dishwashing detergent instead of alcohol. A, a lot yeah. cheaper and just as effective and doesn't take as much time in shaking and getting the mites off of the um, insects, out for the bees. Dawn uh, brand. The it, has to be, it has to be Dawn. <laughs> well, it's where, that's the one Randy has experimented with. Right. Okay, so let's do this. Um, from a from a Varroa mite testing standpoint, are there any other tricks of the trade that uh, Jim, you go through a lot of highs? What are you what are you using? Alcohol wash, I think you said. Or are you? I'm, I'm out. Actually, I'm now using the Dawn, which I kind of like because you can pretty much just put them in the put them in there, let them uh, let them stew for a few minutes, and then a quick swirl, and you can count. So I, I actually like the Dawn method because it's it takes a lot of the labor out. I don't have to shake for two or three minutes myself. I just let them roll around in there. Right. And obviously that's killing the bees, but- It's um, killing the bees. It's like alcohol, the same, same as alcohol, it kills the bees. So you have that question. If you wanna, if you're okay with getting, uh, with killing 300 bees or so, but getting a very accurate mite count, um, you're saving a colony. Um, the other way to do it is the powdered sugar where you're not killing the bees. Um, it's just a little not as accurate, but still, I think it's a pretty good um, assessment of where you are and where your colony is in terms of uh, your mite loads. Um, and then, you know, it's it's on Jer or, um, Jerry, on Randy's uh, website, Scientific Beekeeping, he's got a great graph. And I first saw this graph when he, um, uh, at the California State Beekeepers Association uh, six or seven years ago. And it basically, it just, you know, we all know we have the winter sol we have winter solstice and summer solstice. The summer solstice is the longest day of the year. Generally speaking, that's going to be the highest population of our honeybee colonies, give or take. And what you don't want, if you haven't checked your mites, the colony is growing, 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 growing. And then as we get past the summer solstice, June 20th, it starts to decline as the days are getting shorter. But that mite population is continuing to grow exponentially. So you want to prevent that, that uh, those two lines on that graph of crossing. So it's really important. Um, generally speaking, I find that I'm, I'm, um, my, my mite counts are going up in June. Um, so I try to knock them down at that time as well. Um, so again, very important, go to scientific beekeeping. He's got more uh, information on that site than just about any other site out there. You know, Mike, Mike, there's a really interesting thing that Randy just came up with. And he said he assumed always that the bees would increase and then shortly the, at, but the main point is they would outrun the mites. And he, has, he said he found that actually by actually doing the count, that mites are actually spiking now. And so control exactly what you were doing before is controlling the mites now is actually more important. Because if they if they kind of overwhelm everything now, you don't really see the results of that until later in the year. Right. But if you control them now and minimize your mites now, it just sets you up for greater success. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say it. Um, I don't hate to say it. It's just a matter of fact that it's Varroa is my biggest problem, but um, and I think all of our problems. But I find that I'm treating in this time of the year, you know, end of February, beginning March, when the days are getting warmer, because I'm a formic acid person, again in June. And then again, I want to knock them down going into the winter time um, for those strong to try to ensure that we have strong bees as strong as we can in rate going into uh, the winter time. Um, let's see here. Okay, before we hit the summary, any other questions out there? Um, Mike, 
Yes. Um, so uh, speaking of um, the my test, uh, sugar oil test and so forth, um, the, and I know, um, you know, most of us here are, do not have like uh, the tens of twenties and thirties older hives and mostly like us in a, just in a few hives in the backyard, beekeepers and so forth. So um, one uh, back, going back to my test was this, between the sugar oil and alcohol wash. Um, now, how accurate do we want to get the numbers? Or um, if we do it enough that we can get like a tendency of if we can get like a somewhere, if let's say that we'll, with the, I'm just, uh, powder sugar tests like a guess about 90%, say about 90, 95%. But if I do it often enough, then I can get a tendency of where they at. That's one. So. Um, uh, so I guess that each one is have to decide, but the, the thing is that, you know, testing often enough to get that numbers uh, pretty much at the, uh, uh, where they add. Uh, that's one, my point is. And the other one is that when uh, Randy was uh, here, ACBA, what was it a year before in October? And we had a demonstration at my uh, apiary. And then we did test them, uh, uh, he had a alcohol wash and then we actually, we opened up his hive that I had and they wasn't tested, uh, it hasn't treated for a year and a half. But then again, in between it swarmed quite a bit. So I guess the colony gave them a brood break. Um, but anyway, we tested it and the first alcohol wash was, then we had a, a kind of a general census of how many times we're gonna shake. So we're 10, 20, 30, 40. So then uh, we voted on, we're gonna shake it a hundred times. So we shake, shook the bees and a hundred times, it came out with the 14 mites. And then after that, put the bees into the alcohol wash and they see how many fall off from that. So what, after we did that, there was no mites came out of it. So from the, so I'm just, you know, we just expensive with a Randy, so that he agreed that 100 was enough to give us the close enough to the alcohol wash. And that was kind of experience to see uh, with uh, Randy. So then that became uh, my protocol. And since then, and, and that was my uh, method of doing it since then, that's it. So what you're saying, Sung, is you're shaking the mason jar full of powdered sugar 100 times? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I said earlier that, um, you know, the numbers I've read, it could have been from Randy, um, but usually that sugar roll test is about 80% accurate. But you're saying if you shake them 100 times, it's 100% accurate versus the alcohol wash. Yes, but so. that was only the one time, but, um, you know, with him and he agreed upon it was close enough. Right. So here's my question to you, Sung. Um, yes. For a hive that hadn't been treated in a year and a half, uh -huh. was, was healthy, but you knocked out 14 mites, which is above that 3% threshold. Uh -huh. did, you, did you treat for them? What did you do? Yes, after that, and I changed the game. Up until that year and a half, I didn't treat all the bees. I did a brood break. A drone calling, anything that I know that I've learned, I did that. The so when it comes to 14 mites and then test all the, all other ones and it was uh, either similar or above. Then I changed the games and started treating it from that point on. Right. Um, right, so I, I believe mites are like ants. If you see one, there's yes. a lot more behind it. So, yes. um, and, I, and I believe that there's mites and just about every single hive that you come across feral or otherwise. Um, and I think the feral colonies, what I said earlier was, you know, part of, part of the, the big question that I have or the infighting I have in my brain is sometimes I, I, miss, I miss when they swarm, but I'm not so concerned about it other than, you know, possibly um, wreaking havoc on the neighbors. But it's a brood break, so it's it's definitely helping. It's another tool that the bees have to help them combat the varroa. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, since then, I I play uh, in place the uh, IPM and throughout and uh, uh, year after year, the colony uh, loss was uh, significantly significantly dropped to like almost one or two colony per after the winter. So I'm great. happy with that. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Jesse asked Formic Pro versus Accelic Acid this time. I remember. Um, I use Formic Pro. I saying this for RB Club. As much as I'd like to use oxalic acid, oxalic acid. Can somebody mute? Who's ever? I did. Okay. Um, oxalic acid is still illegal in California, and I am not um, willing to. Uh, I haven't used it yet, just because of, of that. If if Randy, I'm sure at some point it will be legal, and I know plenty of people do it, and I think it's probably just as safe. But I'm not willing to risk my. Uh, my business on it, God forbid something happens with oxalic acid and everybody throws up with their arms and the FDA or whoever goes crazy and blah, 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 blah. So until oxalic acid is legal, um, I haven't used it, but um, so I can't answer that, Jesse. Um, but I'm sure there's plenty of people here that have had great uh, success using oxalic acid, especially with some of the ways that Randy is delivering it in his hives. Um, I thought that somebody had uh, just announced that it is legal now in California in the last week or so, but I hadn't checked. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Um, would that be great? Would you use it if, no. uh, if it were legal? If it were legal, I would use it. But then, you know, I, I find that hard to believe because the biggest problem with oxalic acid is the big manufacturers, you know, they've got to prove to the powers to be that it is effective and, and, um, uh, with or without honey supers on. And that's the other problem we have. Living where we live, we have, I have honey supers on. Some honey supers get thrown on in January, like I, told, I said earlier, and they don't come off till October. So that leaves us very little, um, uh, you know, in terms of treatment, other than as far as I know, form formic acid to use. You can't use Apivar um, legally anyway. And I don't like to use... Um, I don't use miticides. Um, so Mike? Yes. Um, I've seen bees uh, foraging oxalis. Oxalis has oxalic acid in it. So, oh, Jerry, uh, I'm worried about it. There's no, there's no doubt you're right. And I shouldn't be worried about it. It's just that legal part of it that, that I always cringe at. And so I've been reluctant and reticent to use it. But and that, just, that to just to, Mike, just to clarify, Oxalic dribble is an approved method, but vapor and Randy's method for common people, those are the things that are not permitted. The one thing that the, the FDA or USDA, whoever it was, made legal was that you can now use, when using an oxalic dribble, you can use that with the supers on. Okay. That's what, that's what became legal. But all forms of oxalic are not legal now. It's just that one method, the leaving the supers on for the methods that's already approved. Yeah, the, the difference though is it's legal nationally, but California is one of the few states that hasn't approved it directly. Correct. And I don't know, so Robert, do you use the drill? Do you dribble? To me, it, it seems uh, very time consuming. Uh, it, it, it's not that, it, you know, I use it as an, a December treatment. Right. And right. it's not that, it's not that, you know, it's just, it's a, just another, whenever you're visiting the hive, it's a fairly quick, I use an animal syringe and I'll, I'll actually get it on all the brood frames that have clusters. So it's, you know, 10 minutes per hive or five, five or 10 minutes per hive. It's, it's, it's no worse than any other control, right. but okay. I, I like it a lot. I, I think oxalic is a big promise for the future. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I can't wait till Randy gets this approved all the way around, especially his, the, um, it's not the uh, blue shop towels, it's the, and it's not cardboard, but is it the sponge? Greenish sponges, yes. Yeah, so yeah. And, sponges, yeah. And the, 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 if I were a bee, <laughs> they, they seem to be working pretty well for those who are, are indulging in them. Right. Um, okay, so in summary, um, you know, let the bees do all the work, try not to get in their way. 
Um, use all of your senses, not just going into a hive, but use all your senses, smell and the, and the sound and, um, and what you see as the bees are going into the hive to understand their growth. Um, you can learn a lot from just uh, watching them go in and out. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's uh, crystal clear that we must give them room to grow uh, to mitigate that swarm sensation. Uh, you want to be prepared. Uh, so have extra equipment, nukes, whatever. If you um, come across a hive that uh, one of your hives in your apiary that has all of a sudden developed um, queen cells, um, you know, make a decision there to, you're almost probably too late, but, um, you know, begin to split them. Take really good notes. Um, as I found, I get older, half timers kicks in much quicker. Um, this is a great organization. As Jerry said in the beginning of the meeting, 10 bucks is nothing. Um, there's a lot of great beekeepers, and uh, the one thing that I have found with beekeepers is they are more than willing to help out their fellow beekeeper. Um, and you may not like every single beekeeper you come across, but that's okay because there, there's five or six or ten behind them that you would like. Um, so find somebody that you like and you get along with, share ideas, um, ask for help. Um, that's why we have this club. Uh, and all the clubs in the Bay Area, and uh, it's it's really, I started uh, in the Mount Diablo Beekeepers in 2006 or seven, and uh, met one of my mentors there, and it just, I, I can't, I can't thank everybody enough for uh, my growth curve in terms of, of um, learning about bees. I'm still learning every day. There's, you know, if, if some beekeeper tells you they have all the answers, that's not the beekeeper you want to be talking to. Um, and lastly, have fun and enjoy them because, you know, there's plenty of times where um, I'll go up to a hive and just sit and watch. And it's very meditative and uh, uh, I, th I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. So with that, um, let's just open it up to questions. If anyone else has any other comments or uh, tips um, that they use, um, let's hear them now. I'd like to go remember. back to the topic of the, uh, the sugar roll versus the alcohol wash. And just to say that I, I always do the sugar roll. I've never done an alcohol wash. I've got a lot of hives. They always come through the winter all alive. And I know the sugar roll is not as accurate, but I just want to say to people that, I mean, if, if you're doing a sugar roll and you're getting 14, 20, 30, like it doesn't really matter how accurate it is at that point. Like once you get above 10 or 15 mites, it doesn't matter how accurate it is. You have a problem that you have to deal with. So I guess my point is it doesn't have to be like the most precise, accurate test result, the alcohol wash that you could possibly get. The sugar roll is perfectly fine and getting a sense of whether or not you have a problem that you need to manage right then and there or within the next week or two. Um, I'm going back through that. that. That's a great, great point. I think that was Paula who was talking. Um, Jerry asks, why would you need to do a mite count if you know that all hives have mites? Because if all hives have mites, yes, I believe that, but if they're below the threshold, somehow, somehow some way, that colony is managing that mite. And that might be, you know, that might be the colony that figures out um, how to control Varroa for the rest of us throughout the world. I mean, I don't know if you believe this, but I read somewhere that um, it's, not the, it's not the one beekeeper who's got 50,000 hives, it's the 50,000 beekeepers that have one hive that, that might figure this Varroa problem out. And um, there's plenty of really good beekeepers here. We've, we've heard from some tonight that don't treat and they've had really, really good success. And um, hopefully that, uh, that success can lead to, um, you know, the rest of us solving this Varroa problem because it's very difficult to kill a bug on a bug. Um, I think that's all the questions in the chat room anyway. Uh, anything else? Well, also, if you have that hive that, you know, all hives have mites and you have that one that keeps the mite counts low, split it and split it and split it and get those genes out there. And that's why you want to be checking, even if you're not going to be treating. Because you'll, you'll know which are the good ones. Share those queens. And if you have hives that do terribly with Varroa, don't let them raise any drone. And why is that, everybody? Come on. You want to answer your question, Jerry, or your statement? Sure. Go ahead. 
Well, if, if a terrible hive is raising a lot of drone, they're, they're sharing their terrible genes with the rest of the community. Yep. Um, okay, well, um, I think with that, sorry about the technical confusion in the beginning. Um, I'm happy to, you know, it's basic talking and tackling. I don't think there's, you know, I think we're all saying the same thing. Um, if somebody wants my slideshow, I'm more than happy to somehow get it to them. I don't know how I do that, but um, I'm happy to share. Uh, any other questions for Mike? Well, I just, I had a question about harvest time. Um, and I put it in the chat, but um, it was about, seems like we're harvesting most of our honey right before the dearth. Um, and um, how do you manage your wet frames and putting them back on the hives to get cleaned out and, you know, robbing? Um, that's a great question. So it, again, it depends on the time of the year. If I'm harvesting now, I'm putting those frames right back on the hive. Um, if I'm harvesting and taking equipment off in the fall, I'm take, I, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to where I can um, bring those hives back to the property that I live on. I live on a very large property, so um, I take it out into the middle of this property and the bees clean it up themselves and then I store it for the winter time. Um, so that's the way I do it. I guess if you just have it, you know, you're in the backyard, you can freeze those frames until the falling, uh, until the falling winter or the falling spring. I don't know what some people do with their wet frame. Because if you're in a neighborhood, you don't want to open feed for sure because you're gonna attract uh, bees from everywhere and it could get to be a problem, especially um, if it's near your hive. You don't wanna promote robbing of that hive. Any other suggestions out there? What do people do with wet frames in the fall when they've harvested and they have just one or two hives in their backyard? Well, I have, um, uh, the, the, uh, when I saw, you know, the uh, Major Brenzel, and when I went to see his yard, and he left it out outside where air flows and so forth. So I think his most concern was a wax moth. So for that reason, I came out about, uh, say about uh, almost 30 boxes of um, the wet frames came out of uh, after the uh, uh, harvest. So again, so the wax moth was most of the problem, but um, I was fortunate enough to have a refrigerator freezer that I can put in <coughs> 10 frames at a time. I freeze them for about two or three days and then bring it out and then I can was able to store it and haven't been uh, had much of a problem with the wax mouth. And then it just uh, a couple months later, just everything went back out. So um, using the freezer was a really uh, good idea to not to lose any uh, wet frame um, to store it and then lose to the wax and to clean it out and so all the mess. Right. So you store them till the next season? Yes, yeah, somehow. In my living room. <laughs> Just kidding. You know what, Song? I, I, so, I think you're kidding. Knowing you. I don't think he is kidding. I think he's serious. I think he probably right, has So what about, I'm sorry. What about high beetle? Is it, who, are you dealing with high beetle much or is anybody? Because that's, that's a new, you know, just boxes sitting around in, a, in the honey house can't happen anymore. You know, it's funny you say that, Robert. So here, I'm going to share with you my my first encounter with a hive beetle. So I manage hives in uh, Alameda, Marin, Contra Costa, and San Mateo counties. And the first beetle I came across was in San Mateo County uh, on the peninsula, probably in 2012 or 13. And I was freaking right. out. I didn't yeah. know. I, I thought I was the beekeeper who brought the small hive beetle into California. And so I called up Eric Musson and uh, asked him about it. And he said, no, you're not the first one. Don't worry about it. Um, so that I, I was relieved about that. But my story with hive beetle is I, yes, I'm seeing more and more hive beetles are in all the counties now um, that I uh, work in. 
but I've never seen a hive beetle infestation like we see in the Southeast. Um, I haven't heard of one in the Bay Area. That's not to say there hasn't had happened yet, but uh, I have yet to, um, the bees have done a pretty good job of sequestering those, um, those beetles into a corner or whatnot. I know some people have been using the swifter, a little swifter towels or the swifter uh, mop, whatever they are, shredding them up and putting them in there and having good success with that. But I haven't really had to bother with the small hive beetle. And in my, again, I'm kind of fortunate. I've got a big, huge, open, covered area. And all of my um, honey supers, I store there on pallets and I crisscross them. So I'm not stacking them up straight up, but I'm crisscrossing them at 90 degrees. So there's wind going through there and there's open light going through there. So I don't have a, a problem with, with wax moth or the hive beetle. And with empty supers, I don't think you're gonna have a problem with hive beetle because they need the protein from the pollen and the and honey really to, to do their damage. Um, but I don't know, has anybody had a problem with uh, hive beetle? Yeah, I've got a honey house in Mill Valley and um, this last year I, I had late in the season when it was still a little bit warm all of a sudden I had an infestation and they they went to town and they just would eat all the pollen and the protein layers and and then and then the just the larvae just started going crazy uh. and I've got a honey conditioning box which has uses light bulbs for heat and all of them would hatch out of the of the boxes and frames and head towards the heat and the light and they would they would all connect, collect in this little area below the door, you know. It's just like they found the right moderated heat source that they liked, and and so I pulled the door off the thing and just end up smashing lots of them. But I mean, they're 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 here, is what I'm saying. Yeah, they're, they're I, definitely here. I think for everyone, it's just a matter of when they get to you. Right. But it's 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 a much bigger problem than people are letting on, especially in a honey house. Right. Honey houses can just get overwhelmed by them. Yeah, I I don't have a honey house, so. I wish I did, but I don't. I was actually trying to find a video. I had we had one. It was in a very small group, and uh, Austin actually took a video of it. I was trying to find the video because it, uh, it it was it, it like liquefied everything. It was just like this disgusting view uh -huh. at the bottom. But out of you know from you know that's the only one I've ever had. That the only other only Duke I've ever had that had a problem. With. Yeah. So no, you're right. You're right, Robert. Um, there, and, and, you know, I've, I've kind of struck it up that we don't, you know, the Southeast is really hot and humid for the most part, and that's where they thrive, and you kind of have colder winters, so I, I think that they're not as prevalent as they are in the Southeast, but they certainly are adapting, that's for sure, right? I, um, I have a couple of neighbors in my neighborhood who were not, they had bees but weren't taking care of their bees, and I kind of took them over for them, and both of them, they're right down the street from me, both of them had I mean, dozens and dozens of beetles in the hives, but amazingly, no, no slime outs. The bees were still able to manage it. And uh, I used traps for a while. I used those little traps that you put oil in and, you know, they, they caught a lot of beetles, but they were just a mess. And I stopped using them. And now it seems like, you know, they're around, but they're not really so much of a problem, at least um, in these hives that are nice and strong. And Robert, you should get some chickens and put them in your honey house. <laughs> they'll love those larvae. <laughs> that's a great suggestion. <laughs> yeah. And and that that's a key. I think that was Paula that was talking. You know, a strong hive will um, will go a long way as to um, taking care of wax moth and small hive beetle. Remember, it's small hive beetle and wax moth are not killing your bees. They're only coming in when you have a weaker colony where the colony can't defend all the space that. Uh, um, is in is in a hive. That's one of the reasons why I'll reduce box, reduce the size of a colony if I have to going in the winter time. You know, Anything you were else? talking. Uh, you were talking earlier about um, clean, cleaning up uh, harvested frames. <clears throat> and going into winter, I was concerned that my hive was going to be honey bound, so I took like four four medium frames of honey out just so that they could have some room. And uh, it was my first harvest. You know, I haven't even been doing this a year yet, and I did it the old manual scrape in the comb way, and turned out to be a huge mess. But we did we did pretty good. Well, so I have these four frames now, <clears throat> and I'd seen videos about leaving them outside, and bees will come and clean them up. So I did that. But you know, I, I live in a track house. I got like six thousand square feet, so I put it on the opposite side of the yard from my hive because you know for robbing and stuff, and no bees 
paid any attention to those four frames. Not at all. They sat out there for a week. So I, I couldn't believe it. So I called Phil Staub and said, hey, you know, what do I do with these? And he said, well, you know, if the bees are ignoring them, just uh, stick another super on top and put them in there and they'll clean them up. <clears throat> so I did that. And uh, a couple of days later, I looked in there and they were absolutely spotless clean. And the bees had started rebuilding the wax on them and had gotten quite a ways on it and had actually started refilling them with honey already. So I figured, well, shoot, you know, if they're that gung ho, I stuck a bunch more empty frames in there and filled the super out. <laughs> and, and they just kept going. I got another full super of honey, you know, come January. That's a good story. Yeah, I just found that it brought robbers to my apiary um, when I put them right back on the hive. And um, the bees that were on the hive that I put them on were struggling to, on a daily basis, um, to protect the hive and do their business. Well, you can put robbing screens on the entrances. Yeah, I have all that. So we have uh, my, uh, or not my, uh, small hive beetle issues down here in Fremont. And I've been using um, screen bottom boards with uh, um, diatomaceous earth on the bottom tray. And that seems to do a pretty good job of it. Um, and I've, I've, this year, the first time I tried um, what you were talking about, Mike, was uh, um, taking the, uh, the boxes and uh, sitting on, on top of each other, 90 degrees to each other. And it seemed to work. I mean, I didn't have any uh, moths or beetles in there this winter. So, but I've, I've got my boxes in kind of an open screened uh, area. So um, I don't know if that's what other people have, but it uh, seemed to work very good. Well, why we, why we've got a moment there, since I'm now an old timer, let me, uh, one of the old timer tricks about, you know, uh, clearing those supers without drawing a crowd is to put a uh, like a level a plywood level or something like it with a just very small hole in it and then the supers above that and then the bees think that going out through that little tiny hole it's like going out to an outside honey source and so it doesn't broadcast to the world that there, there are resources out there but the bees will clean it out because they think that they're going some el somewhere else to pick up the resources. Can you explain that again, Robert? So uh, you take your standard hive and you put a like a, just a piece of plywood with a single three quarter inch hole in it, on and top. then put the su put the supers above that, and then you're you're lit on top of all those. Oh, okay. And so essentially, what you have is a little tiny hole that the bees go through. Kind of in their mind, it's like it's going to the outside world to an external honey source. And so they go up and they'll clean it out without refilling it. And it's, it's just, they get the, the, the sort of um, knack of wanting to go clean out and bring it back. And just by going through the little hole, it makes it a, an external location. It's now, like, a, it more, like an inner cover a small hole, right? Correct, right. correct, exactly. Would the inner cover hole be too big? Uh, I think so. Okay. Well, you can always tape it if you, off. If you just, if you, or you could just lay something, a little piece of wood on top of it that restricted right. it. But, but just a little hole made them, made them feel like they were being, you know, crafty about it. I've done that where I put them above an inner cover, and it seemed that work. Great. Yeah. See that, that? That's the kind of tip you get the Alameda County beekeepers. From that. right. What's well, that, I can't tell you what old timer that came from, but that maybe Spencer Marshall, but. Yeah, those little little tricks are really good. <laughs> so, Mike, what is the uh, uh, hint that a, a hive is going to swarm? What is the hint the hive is going to swarm? When you start seeing um, the brood nest get backfilled by honey, that's one of the bigger ones. Um, when you start seeing, when when the hive is full, you open it up, it's full or it's getting full. You see a combination of that. You see a combination of swarm cups being um, uh, formed. 
Those are kind of my two clues, two bigger ones. I think a big one is the, uh, the brood pheromone. When you go out and you, everyone thinks it's honey, but it's actually the brood pheromone. And when that tends to be overwhelming, overwhelmingly wafting out of the hive, it's kind of an indicator for them that they need to swarm. So if you can smell it, that's a good, a good get going kind of signal. All right, any other questions? I do. Mike, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about diseases that you've encountered and how have you addressed them? Um, I've encountered AFB in uh, San Mateo County a number of years ago. It was a person who contacted me, wanted me to take over managing their hives, um, came across those hives and promptly burned them all. Um, that's really the only time I've come across AFB personally. Um, all the Varroa diseases, you know, whether it's deformed wing virus, anything that comes comes from Varroa, you get those every single year. A little bit of chalk brood, but not a whole heck of a lot. Um, early on, um, a little bit of nosema. <coughs> it wasn't that bad. The colony, I, I didn't treat for it, and the colony was able to. Um, Fight its way out of it, and uh, haven't come across European foul brood. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other nasty diseases that are out there. It's mainly it's mainly diseases, whether it's parasitic, you know, the mite syndrome or the form wing virus. That that's that sort of thing that comes from um, uh, varroa infestation. So you address varroa, and that pretty much takes care of most of those things, as, as best as I can. And, yeah. You know. So I was going to ask you a question because you manage a lot of hives in a lot of different areas. Do you worry about transferring equipment? I mean, do you mix equipment from one spot to another or do you try to keep them all separate? I do not. So the, the hives that I manage are owned by my customers. So they stay put on. They're not, they're not getting moved around. So how do you harvest something like that? You must harvest each hive individually. Correct. Wow, that's, that's a lot back. of work. So that's a lot of work, isn't it? Uh, 2020, 2019, I harvested every single day of the month of October, except for. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, thank you. <laughs> I lug a, uh, a 30 year old Dedant um, 12 <clears throat> extractor to my customer's house, uncapping bin, you know, uncap everything there. All the honey's theirs. Even Sounds like a real job. job. <laughs> that's a, that's really <laughs> admirable. Greg, huh? Greg. Yes, sir. The, um, the mics uh, uncapping the, uh, what do you call it, the extracting honey. Okay, the, I followed him and I videotaped him. And that's the video I put it on TikTok. Okay. That one went viral. <laughs> oh, was that him? Video. I thought that was you. Yeah. I no, no, that was... that's, that's the, okay, that's Mike, okay? Oh, really? So, yep, that's went viral. So uh... far, 30 million points, 30.7 million views. Oh, I thought that was you. He's an art, you're an artist with the darn uh, heat uh, decapper. That's like, yeah. that's pretty cool. I mean, so now he's, actually, he's the worldly known, the best uncapping, uh, uncapper, yes. So I think uh, you know, you're famous, Mike. I think yeah. I think Jeannie Jeannie said she was like mesmerized by watching that guy that uncapper is like, yeah, he's he's pretty good. I thought that was you. No, no. Not a cup of coffee got me absolutely nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> See, so I never, never never unclaimed it. I, everybody thought it was him. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know that, son. That's good. Yep. You too. You too. When you when you uncap frames as much as myself or probably Robert or or Jim, you'll you'll find it goes pretty quick. Yeah, I was trying to talk these guys into using a heat gun to uncap, and I think telling them, "Oh yeah, that's pretty fast." But then when I saw that video, I said, oh, I backed way off. I go, "That was pretty impressive uh, work you were doing." You know, it's interesting. There's a a, a, a beekeeping friend of mine. Um, called me the other day and he came across a video of, I don't know who the beekeeper was somewhere here in the US, 
who took, he went to like a thrift shop and found an electric carving knife. And the yeah. knife was long enough and it was long enough to go across a, a medium frame. And he put a rheostat on it and a foot pedal for the on and off switch. And the rheostat was the, you know, how quickly the blade would go back and forth. And that thing was, that thing was jamming. There's a, there's a YouTube video of a guy who does that. In fact, I bought one of those uh, carving knives to do that. I was going to give one to Sister Barbara <laughs> as a gift. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's a pretty cool deal. So, but no, that's why I'm not a fan of honey. I love to eat honey, <laughs> but hauling honey around is no fun. <laughs> wow. I'm impressed. Yeah. When it's on rooftops. Don't do rooftop hives. In the rear end. <laughs> yeah. Any other question for Mike? How did you get uh, started doing that? I mean, did you, was it like picking up one at a time? Is that how you did this? Or? Yeah, it was all word of mouth. My, my very first customer was introduced by a friend of mine. It's the, um, it was the Alameda County, or Alameda County, it was the Alameda Natural. Uh, Mark, uh, natural grocery store, the marketplace in Alameda. And, um, and then it just kind of grew from there. I seeded it with, um, I had some friends who were willing to host my hives. And then from there, you know, got word of mouth and it just kind of grew to where people wanted their own hives. I mean, as we all know, uh, honeybees are front page news for the last bunch of years. And ev everybody is interested in honeybees. Um, I think we, um, Sue is working on, you know, the county and the unincorporated area of the county to um, somehow res uh, relax the, the very stringent laws. And I, I think it's going to be easy to, it won't be easy to do, but it'll get done because, you know, it's hard to say you can't have honeybees. Um, so there's a lot of people interested in it. And, and at least my experience, those that have honeybees, including ourselves, we become very, very, very passionate about it. And, uh, when you when they lose a hive for whatever reasons, um, I've had clients cry, and I keep telling them. I said, "Look, it, it's gonna happen. Um, it's just a matter of time." But um, they just fall in love with it, and um, it's it's been a, it's been a great great uh, little business over the last eleven years. I've enjoyed it, except for my back. <laughs> I mean, look at Jim. I think Jim, you and I kind of started out the same time with uh, Terry. Yeah, with Terry. Terry's looking like he's backing down. He's he's the one that taught me, you know, to use all deeps, and then he switches out to to deep and a medium. I said, wait a second. <laughs> that was kind of a bait and switch on on teaching. <laughs> at, least, at least I was smart enough or naive enough to know that I did not did not want to sling around what ninety pound or hundred pound deeps full of honey. I don't know how he does it. This guy, this our mentor, friend of ours is 66. 65, 66, 65, somewhere in there. And he'll he'll pick up doubles and just manhandle them around. I mean, the guy, well, he, he's an animal. I mean, he goes into almonds and he's, you know, it's all, you know, he's using a hand cart. I mean, we're using forklifts and pallets and he's using a hand cart and, you know, an old rickety trailer. <laughs> old rickety trailer. First time I went to his bee yard, um, I wasn't expecting to go into his highs and I was in shorts and flip-flops and a t-shirt. He goes, come on, let's go look at some bees. I go, well, he goes, come on. And no veil, no nothing. I mean, his bees, he's just, um, he's, he's very, uh, he's, his bees are super gentle and he doesn't tolerate pissy bees. Um, and he's just, he's been doing it for a very, very, you know, 55 years, I think. Yeah, some, some, some unreal number. Before. The walking encyclopedia. Do you notice that colonies sometimes get pissy for a while and then settle down? Uh, yeah, and it's either because of ants or they're missing a queen. Um, I have a couple colonies that I'll requeen because they are, I don't wear gloves. I hate wearing gloves for just about everything. Um, but if I start getting stung a lot because it's a pissy colony, I'll requeen it. Um, as quickly as I can, uh, mainly because you don't want that kind of a colony in a neighborhood um, or somebody's backyard, but um, also because I don't want to get stung all the time when I'm 
check them. It's, it's, it's nice to open a hive and just watch the bees spill out and have their controlled, chaotic, organized chaos um, and watching them. And th that's the fun part. When they start bumping you and then beginning to sting you, that's, that's not that fun. When you have to put gloves on, that's where I draw the line. Any other any other questions for Mike or statements or comments or something? Joke? You got a good joke? No good jokes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. As usual, very very informative. I do appreciate. Thank you. That was a great talk. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.